Welcome to Zeiss Full Exposure, the video podcast that goes behind the scenes with some of the industry's most innovative visual storytellers. Now here's your host, photographer and filmmaker, Jim Camp. Last November in New York City, the Manhattan Editor's Workshop held its fifth consecutive evening entitled Sight, Sound, and Story, The Art of Cinematography. I was invited to moderate a chat with acclaimed cinematographers Claudia Roshka, DP on such docs as Mad Hot Ballroom and RBG, and Tom Hurwitz, ASC, who was DP on such notable docs as the Oscar-winning Harlan County, USA, and The Queen of Versailles. In part one of two episodes, Claudia and Tom discuss their perspective on how they approach telling each story visually. Um, we have with us uh, Claudia Roshki. Roshki, did I do it? Yeah. You can come out or stay there, I don't know. Um, you may know her from credits like RBG, Mad Hot Ballroom, among others. We also have Tom Hurwitz, with an easier to pronounce last name. Um, if you know American Dream and Barbara Koppel's work, um, you uh, Queen of Versailles, then you know this gentleman. And also, Jim Camp, who is a producer, a podcaster, and a uh, generally all around nice guy. We had a nice talk. I used your joke. Did you hear it flop? Did you hear it die? We used it, though. All right, so another round of applause for our documentary panel. I'm going to give Tom the microphone. Enjoy. <laughs> it flopped, and you credited me. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, it's really uh, a treat for me to be here with these two great filmmakers. Um, we're going to... Um, you probably are aware by looking at the... Um, the, I don't know, what are their brochures or something like that, or things there that tell you about some of their credits. Uh, you just heard about some of them. Uh, we're going to look at a few clips tonight that they brought along. And I guess we'll kind of, wait, is it tonight? No, it's kind of the afternoon. But um, <laughs> we're going to be sort of in the moment, a little bit freewheeling. Um, we'll try to catch some uh, topics that... Uh, sort of hue to what the theme is. Um, and um, we'll go along from there. Um, I think we've got um, something uh, queued up. Actually, I, want, wanted, to, I re wanted to read a, qu a quote from, um, I'm gonna read a couple of quotes. Uh, this one is from uh, Robert Drew, who many of you probably know was one of the early um, midwives, I guess or uh, godfather, uh, godfathers of uh, direct cinema. Um, and he said, great photography, particularly in motion pictures, is hidden in simplicity. Great impact, strong human character, the unforgettable moments of drama always arrive through your camera by means of the simplest and most direct way of seeing. Um, I think that um, kind of echoes in uh, Claudia and Tom's work. Uh, I've been fans of both of their work for a long time. Um, so uh, if we can take a look, to, um, let's take a look at uh, the first clip that Tom brought along, which is... Um, um, if I could introduce it just for oh, a second. Yeah, please. No, I was going to ask you to set it up. Um, so this is a film that's almost finished uh, called Can You Bring It? Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Waters. And it's a film about... Uh, a piece of art, uh, the log line that we use, and if you know, if you've been in the, in the process of uh, making an independent documentary, you'll know the use of a log line uh, is uh, the challenge of art in the face of catastrophe. Um, and and uh, this is a, about a, a ballet that Bill T. Jones, who's perhaps our Ameri American's now greatest living choreographer, uh, made in, in the 1980s, in the midst of the AIDS crisis, directly after the death of his partner and artistic collaborator, Arnie Zane. And it, 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 asks, it does several things. It talks about the struggle to make that dance, and it talks about the ability of people now to find something in their lives that has as much at stake, perhaps, in a similar way to the way people existed during the AIDS crisis when we lost so many people from our industry as well as all the artistic industries in New York and all over New York. Um, so that's the film. 
and its connection to in the moment, uh, each one of the clips that I brought have a different relationship to the moment. Uh, this one is spontaneity and improvisation, but in, an, in a controlled environment. So you'll see uh, a photography that is dance on stage, that is choreographed dance. You'll see photography that is dance from an audience point of view. And you can look at the difference between that and the difference in the way that it, it's approached. And then also um, a scene in a studio uh, shot cinema verite of, uh, of Bill T. Jones with the young dancers. So this is the beginning of the film. Four, D-Man in the Water, a New York Dance and Performance Award is presented to Bill T. Jones. <laughs> Uh, we are as good as our last performance. Yeah. yeah. We are all going to die. I uh, am black man. I obsess. My mother lives alone. Arnie is dead. The company is with me. I am scared. Doing D-Man in the Water is a very big experience, very big. It was like being in a dream, and it was just like yesterday. And yet much has fallen away. D-Man is very, very big, it looms large. But I was surprised how much it has shaped the dance experience. People do it elsewhere, out of student companies. It's always in somebody's thoughts. Clem. Okay, go back. We're a little late. So pull and make back. sure that you're swimming. Pull Keep the pelvis to, uh, square, to right? Okay, uh, um, Roz, I, yes. this is a question. I'm sure you've seen everything, but I thought these were always this oh. going here, mm -hmm. right? And uh, she's doing this. Yeah, this. That, I directed her that way because I thought that that's what it was. But, well, um, you know what? And uh, Lord knows how many different ways it's been done, but I wonder if it might be more consistent if we were to do this okay. and, see, and see how that works with the... With the Keep it yeah. more square, this. Pelvis in particular, but now what is it? What's the rhythm? And dia, dia, da, pa, pa, di, da, pa, da, ah. When you fall, what happens? Now, is that is what if it? What if it was here for da, and then it is quicker da and mu and da da bi ya da da pa. See, that's what I had wanted. The, the contrast between the moments that have lassitude, longueur. And those quick things. Yeah. They're moving very, very fast, but they shape their, they, they seem to be making the music do what they want it to do. And that's what this was, right, yeah. Yeah, because, no, because in a moment we're going to be right back to this nervousness again. Right. Although it shouldn't be nervous. Shouldn't be nervous. Now, um, right. I want you to, let me, let me see your positions. Let's all do the positions, please. Ready, and a. Just want to see how the mechanism works.
Tom, um, what were um, what were the challenges of taking something that had been uh, performance? It was it was obviously a very personal performance uh, per piece too, uh, and bringing that into the current day. Well, um, because the experience of doing the dance as well as choreographing the dance, um, Bill speaks throughout the film. But the, and the dancers who were originally part of the company do too. But because the experience of actually doing the dance is central to the transformational character of the work on the people who do it, right? So it resurrects them. And it also resurrects the students, these Southern California, very sheltered students. It winds up resurrecting them too. But anyway, so I needed to show the dance from a dancer's point of view, not just from the audience point of view, which is the way you mostly see dance, or from a, a 3D camera point of view where it's all constructed. But I wanted to make the, the viewer feel like they were part of the dance themselves. And so I had to, um, the problem with that is that this had to cut with performance material, and it had to cut with the same company performing the dance from the front, because it, it, didn't, it didn't only exist on the stage, it also existed as a performance. So it had to look like a performance, and also be able to be shot on the stage. If any of you have ever tried this with dance, you will know that uh, it's extraordinarily difficult, because dance is mostly lit by side light. So every time the camera points into the wings, it flares because those lights are actually lighting the people, right? And that disrupts the shot every time you go around them. So we couldn't have that. So we had to create a new lighting scheme that looked the same as side lit <laughs> from when you were on the stage. And, and that, was the, that was the challenge of that. And then, th then shooting the dance in, in a way that was like being a dancer with the dance, with the da other dancers. Um, and, uh, and we did that uh, wonderfully. I, I, my mother was a modern dancer, and so I've lived in the world of dance for, for uh, my lifetime. Um, and, and the other cameraman who, did the, who operated, I don't think any of his footage is in that, but who operated the Movi, the steady kind of steady cam type uh, uh, device? <clears throat> it was a Tortillo, and <clears throat> and he uh, he is married to a dancer and has been filming dance all his married life, <laughs> at least. So uh, it, it it worked. It helped. Okay. Without getting too technical, can you talk a little bit about how the lighting changed for this? How you fashioned it? <clears throat> sure. We. Um, I worked with this, my wonderful gaffer named Ned Halleck, who's just a master. And uh, he's had a lot of experience with stage lighting. So it was a very kind of fluid and good relationship. And we worked out a, a lighting plot where the side light was lifted to what, what are called the pipe ends. So they're the, the ends of the horizontal lighting pipes, electrics they're called, um, that run over the stage. So instead of coming in straight from the side, it came in at an angle high enough so that we could keep it out of the lens most of the time. What was your choice of uh, equipment for this to shoot it on lens-wise and everything? Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, we shot the slow-mo on uh, an Amira. Um, we shot the Movi on an Alexa Mini, and my handheld work, which is pretty much what you saw there, was on a C300 Mark II um, with, uh, I guess, the 17 to 55. Hmm. Was it stabilized? No. Oh, wow. Just, just by me. Yeah. <laughs> Was um, was the so were you saying was the trickiest part was because you had uh, footage that was shot in the late eighties that was going to be interwoven with that. right and we but we needed to the audience needed to know the difference right that's why we 
we made it clear in this clip which is archival and which is not, and we s took the color out of the archival in this. Later on, when you see it, the color is back in, but it's identifiable and people, people know what they're seeing. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some very powerful historical moments that are archival, and, and uh, it, it, the quality of the footage pretty well tells you what it is. Right, I don't think, right. I mean, we've never had, we've done a, a fair amount of test screening of this. We've never had anybody be confused about that, so I guess we ma managed to do it. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Looks beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, you, you talked uh, briefly about, uh, I, think you, I think you mentioned it when you're talking to your students about, uh, or there was an SVA piece that, um, because you teach at the master's program, a social doc, master's program SVA. Yes. And you talk about articulate images. Yes. Can you uh, refer to that a little bit as it relates to the uh, piece we just saw? Okay. So it's not my word. <clears throat> it comes from a, uh, a, a senior uh, director who unfortunately, because of his time in this world, had to make his career in the field of sponsored documentaries. So most of what he did was finding either companies or, or uh, uh, nonprofit institutions, but I think it was mainly companies to make films for. He's one of my first directors that I worked for, and he wrote a book about filmmaking, and his name is Lee Bobker. His name was Lee Bobker. He's died maybe 20 years ago. But um, he invented the term <clears throat> articulate image, and it stuck in my brain because it really meant to me what I was trying to do my entire life and what I continue to try to do, which is that it, it's an image that uses all of our technique and skill at the surface of the story. So, so it's not meant to be an image that pull, calls attention to your style or your uh, particular virtuosity as a camera person, but it's an image that works at the service of the film and the story that the film tells. And uh, I, I tell my students to make that their goal too. Pretty cool. Um, let's move on to the next clip that you brought along, which okay. is uh, from uh, The Last Emperor. Would you please right. set that up for us? Right, so this is a film about the designer Valentino. The film was called uh, Valentino, The Last Emperor. The director was Matt Turnauer, whose most recent film is uh, Where Is My Roy Cohn, which is a wonderful and very current film uh, about this character in American history, uh, recent American history. Um, and and uh, <clears throat> this is a film about Valentino, who's an extraordinary character who spans, his life spans the period from artisanship in design, where clothes were made by hand for the very, very, very rich, to a time where that there is no longer the economy for that. Uh, and uh, it's still made for the very, very, very rich. Not, not with the same beauty of, of artisanship and skill. Um, and this, so this is the end of his tenure at his design firm. And he's doing it with his partner of almost 50 years, uh, Giancarlo Giametti, um, who, who uh, was his lover and isn't anymore, but is his business partner and is his, is his uh, kind of the person who's really helped him become what he is and stay that way. And uh, the, this is the, the element of uh, being in the moment uh, where you don't know what the moment's gonna be at all. This is, this is really improvisational cinematography. It begins with the creation of a dress which is then brought to Paris from Rome and, uh, and you'll see that he and his partner, it kind of sets up the relationship with he and Giancarlo. And then uh, he goes to uh, an event in which he's given the uh, 
the order of um, the Legion, the Legion of Honor, Legion d'Honneur. So he's given he's given the Legion d'Honneur in France, and uh, so you'll see what happens. But when it's done, I'll tell you a little bit about what I faced to try to make this happen in the moment and to capture it. Ci mettiamo il modellino qua, mm -hmm. che fai così, fai tutto 21 in modo che c'è, ecco, ah, okay. tutto il raggetto, poi dopo ti fai tutto 5 centimetri. Allora, gli mettiamo una croce prima no, della... Ah, ah, ah. L'idea è bella. Ho paura che sia, ne siano tante. Una volta quando sono tutte scintillanti, tutte in giro, sono, si toccano quasi. Quello ci serve per, per lavorare adesso per noi. Ho paura che sia tutto. No, bellissimo l'effetto. Vabbè, io non so, domani dovete farmelo vedere questo, eh. ma come fate a farmelo Tutti vedere? Tutti quelli che abbiamo, perché non è che sono tutto il davanti. Ah, il davanti. Tutto okay, il davanti, lei è bello. Ok, okay. <ride> ok, andiamo allora, via. Ah. francamente che anche sto fatto di avere un gruppo, poi un po' di vuoto, un gruppo, un po' di vuoto, non mi, non mi dispiace, eh? perché lo rende un pochino più leggero e più pulito. Io lascerei, io lascerei davanti così e dietro farei, vedi, da qua farei due, 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 e poi davanti continuerei. Bellissimo sto vestito, pazzesco. Per te che direi di Merci beaucoup. Merci. Ciao. 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 Tiriamo su sta cosa, è bello, è pulito, è pulito. Niente, tirano sul cosino, basta. Andiamo. Ah, bello. No, l'ho fatta apposta, non ho tirato il dito veniva troppo. Sì. Là un po' che sembra che due buchi, eh? Mettiamoli, ci avete due da mettere? Andiamo a portare tutte, sì. Allora mettiamo due, le due lì. Uno qua e uno di là, solamente, ok? In mezzo così. Struttura di palle, siete tutti quanti perché era bello così, senza mettere strisce. Ma sentino, se non ne piace il problema c'è. Tutto perché l'ha detto qualcun altro, mamma mia, tutto perché l'ha detto qualcun altro. No, ma non è vero, se mandano dei buchi pulito. Due buchi, l'ho fatta apposta per non avere tutto il giro. Ho lasciato due strisce, mettiamole, se la gente sviene vedendola. Se si è fatto, si è laureato sta partita. Ma tua parte la prende la. con gli e merci a tutti gli gens che sono venuti. o tutti che siete venuti a me. E will um, never tell you, or tell me specially, uh, directly how much I care o how much I is grateful or how much he understand you did for him. En vertu des pouvoirs qui nous sont conférés, nous vous remettons les insignes de chevalier de la Légion d'honneur.
Beaucoup d'amis et de collaborateurs m'ont accompagné tout au long de ma longue carrière. Et je tiens à les mentionner. Madame Gabriella Battiti, Madame Giardina, Monsieur Bruce Uxema, Monsieur Carlos Souza. J'en aurais beaucoup plus d'autres à mentionner, mais je m'excuse, c'est trop court. Mais ma gratitude... Mais ma gratitude et mon amitié vont tout particulièrement à M. Giancarlo Giannetti. À M. Giancarlo Giannetti, mon associé depuis le début, qui est resté toutes ces années à mes côtés. À lui, personnellement, je tiens ce matin à le remercier avec tout mon estime et toute ma reconnaissance et gratitude. Well, speaking about a moment. <laughs> so, uh, this was a moment that uh, we started in the basement, and we got to the balcony. Um, so you, you notice that he walked in this door to a kind of fancy living room, and that the, was the kind of green room area where he did a grip and grin with the Minister of Culture of France. And of course, we felt we really needed that. Of course not. So instead, uh, uh, we we knew that there was going to be a scrum, the usual cluster of, of uh, press people in, in the room where the award was actually going to be given. So I, I said, please put an, a production assistant right in the middle in the front so I can get a shot. And uh, the, the sound man said, please take this a radio mic and plug it into the malt box so that I can get a signal from the microphone. And uh, so we get done with a grip and grin and we run into the room where this whole thing is happening. And of course, there are no production assistants anywhere. So I push my way to the side. I, there's no way I'm going to get in the front, but I figure if I get to the side, sometimes that's not a bad shot. Uh, and I'm, I'm there, and you see one, one like two-second piece from that position as he begins to talk. And, but I look next to me, and I see, oh, that's the company, the, the Valentino company cameraman. He's there. He's getting that shot. So I'm going to go back and get Giancarlo. So I make my way to Giancarlo, and I, I start to shoot him. And then I hear... Valentino begin the wind up to thank people. I'm at the back of the crowd. There are 25 people, 25 people deep between me and the front of the scrum of reporters. And I just, I, I just, I, I, I take the, the little LED screen and I flip it down and I throw the camera up in the air and I got the shot. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> so I, I zoom in a little bit, and, and thank goodness for image stabilization, uh, I, I can hold it. And, and uh, so he starts, and then he begins the wind up to Giancarlo, and I whip around to Giancarlo, and he's there. You see that I have to find him. And then it goes on, and then he begins to cry again, and I whip around again. A anyway. It, it was absolutely by the seat of my pants. It was like hanging on the cliff by the, my fingernails. I'm assuming you didn't know there was a, he was going to give a tribute to Giancarlo. I thought he wasn't. I mean, that's what I was preparing for, was Giancarlo being bitter. 
you know, because that's the way he'd been all the way through. So to have, to have Valentino break down in tears, I mean, this is something just doesn't happen. And, uh, and to have him cry and, and, and connect in that way across a whole crowd of people. I mean, it, it, it actually wound up to be the best it could possibly be. Um, so sometimes the documentary angels give you what you need. Also, it was, um, was, did I read correctly that um, this was basically his goodbye, his swan song, uh, and that was not, you did not know that ahead of time? Um, not this day. Uh, there was a celebration of 40 years of designing in Rome that the whole film leads up to. That's the end of the film, and that is his swan song. Then his company is taken over by one multinational and another multinational, and it disappears into the, into the conglomerate stew, and mm. that's the end of his involvement with the company. But that was kind of a strange timing that just happened to... Yeah, sort we, of we had no... And in fact, when we started out to make the film, we had no... The, the, the drama was, he, was his relationship to Giancarlo and coming out because he'd never admitted that, that he was gay and, and, and that this was a gay relationship. So um, th that was what the film was basically about. And in the beginning, we stayed away from this other company that was slowly eating up his company because we didn't know what it was about. And then all of a sudden, we saw, oh my god, this is the story. Um, so the editing challenge for um, Bob Eisenhardt, who cut the film, wonderful editor who cut the film, was to take that story that we really only began to film toward the end of the, the process of making the film and pull it backwards chronologically so that it, it kind of weaves in and out of the film uh, so that you get little hints of what's going on. That's very cool. I want to see Claudia's work. I was going to say, we're we're going to just stay with your work for the entire evening. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> right. I'm we, kidding. We don't have two ferns, so. Um, uh, let's. I uh, do, you, do you know which one we're seeing first? And I was. No okay. I think you, we're. You're in charge. <laughs> uh -oh, we're in trouble then. Uh, I think we're seeing the plastics uh, piece. Potentially. Yes. So could you set that up for us? Uh, sure. So. Um, this show is called Activate. It is a Nat Geo show, and uh, it's a six-part mini doc series. And uh, the whole aim is to kind of uh, uh, create uh, an activism that uh, everybody can join into through an organization called Global Citizen. And it's an app that you can download, and Global Citizen works very closely with a lot of governments around the world to uh, end extreme poverty. And so they have different campaigns uh, around the world that they focus on in the Philippines. It was plastics um, and how plastic ultimately leads to extreme poverty, especially in the Philippines where uh, most of the income is through fishing and uh, um, the livelihood of many, especially those who are very, very poor, uh, depends on fishing. And if they continuously, basically, just catch plastic, then uh, that is uh, certainly uh, has a huge impact on their lives. And uh, there are many other shows. One was about sanitation and water, clean water access in Nigeria, where ultimately, um, you know, the... Uh, the issue was disease-borne illnesses through contaminated water and not having any provision by the government to, for clean water in uh, many parts of the rural um, you know, surrounding of uh, big cities like Abuja. Um, but let's focus on activate on, on the plastics in the Philippines. And uh, yeah, let's go. Okay. Let's take a look. Thank you. Dong, pagaluhalo kanin baboy dong ha. Ha? Bukod kanin baboy ha, bukod basura ha. Ako po si Esther Mendoza, nakatira po sa Malabon. 64 years old, pero ito pa po malakas ako. Basura! 
Kumbaga po ako ay waste warrior po ng Malabon. May mga nabubulok na dito. Halo-halo naman ito lang eh. Oo, oh, kaya nga yung ipagpapalay natin yan. Lugay mo nga sa ano. Basura! We give each house this flyer describing its kind of waste and what to do with it. And every day, the waste collector will come and check if they did this. We hire these collectors. One of our objectives is to get a collector who is in the neighborhood. So our, the collectors know the people. Jeng, basura! Jeng, basura po tayo! Bukod po, Daya, pero bukod yung kanin, bukod yung basura, ha? Pakiusap lang po. Ang tagal ko na po sinasabi sa inyo yan, eh. Eh, ang ginagawa po nung kolektor nila, hinihila lang po, hindi nisinasakay sa kariton, kung baga sa ano yung malapake, alam. Po, pinasok nila ako, nagumpisa po talaga, kinuha nila ako. Sige, sa umpisa, yung kolektor po yun, o magbakas yung sabing ganon. Napakalaking malahalaga sa akin, kahit bumarumi siya. Napakalaking tulong sa akin. Yung asawa ko pumunta doon sa probinsya, ako na talaga. Wala nang ibang umano sa akin kasi wala na ako na. Yun po ang akin. Kasi doon lang po ako umaasa ng kabuhay namin mag-iina. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Can I push with you? Yeah. All right. It's a parade. We're here in Barangay Potrero learning about what the local community is doing to prevent plastics from heading to a landfill or going right into the ocean. Basura po! Narito na po ang kolektor na maganda! Basura po! Nandito na po ang kolektor na maganda at sexy! <laughs> Basura! <laughs> this is probably one of the cleanest neighborhoods that I've noticed. Plastic mm -hmm. and then diaper. So they've separated? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Diaper and oh, Okay. Everybody leaves out their trash. And it's already segregated into different categories. So you have plastics, you have uh, diapers. Those are really fun. Every day, two sacks. And if they don't, yeah, you experience the wrath of Esther. Bawal po! Naglagay ng tubig. Bawal po yun! Bawal po yung ganun! Tumutulo! Huwag pong matigas ang ulo natin. Ay, wait. Gusto niyo pa magagalit ako? Lagyan kayo ng penalty, ticket? If you don't follow the rules, she's gonna lay the hammer down. Very clearly. So it's interesting because, you know, I've... Uh, um did not quite remember that this this particular clip did not include all the water, uh, you know, and the fishermen that that we were uh, well, that we have in the show. And so, you know, it's uh, it just shows you a moment in time when clearly Darren Chris is uh, been asked, who is an actor and who is very uh, active in terms of uh, social issues and participating in this campaign, uh, becomes our. Uh, motivation for especially global citizens to engage because he has a huge, huge, uh, you know, following on, on social media. So he ultimately ends up posting through his iPhone what he's doing and then, you know, it gets such an incentive sent uh, through the likes and, you know, the link to participate. So in this clip, it's really interesting because uh, it is, for me, just following the action, not knowing what's happening. You have to understand that this particular uh, show was very tightly scheduled, but the way it was scheduled was like, okay, you know, we're gonna be at four o'clock or at, you know, whatever, 10 a.m. in the morning, we're gonna be with, uh, you know, Esther doing the garbage collection, and then, and, and then at, you know, uh, 11 o'clock we're gonna be here, and it was very tightly scheduled. And I had not been to the location, so there is just not knowing what you're getting into. You don't know how the light is going to be, what road they're going to go down. And so it's very, very spontaneous. And the, the challenge is in those scenes to be very uh, reactive, but yet ask yourself consistently, is this shot going to further uh, the story? Will this be impactful enough for the audience to really identify? Um, is this more about character development? Uh, should I linger longer to find an emotional beat. Uh, so it is that constant 
you know, uh, thinking of where do I move to? What is my best angle? How do I really capture what's going on? What is the essence of what's going on? How long is this going to go? And even though that each moment that I photograph is in my head like this is the entire movie. That's how I approach it. This is the entire movie. Make sure that I get every single possibility because I don't know in the end of how the editor is going to sculpt it. And it is very different when you're doing cinema verite in a very unpredictable situation um, where you know for a television uh, you know, news uh, show that they will you know, compress it. They will not give it the breath that you have in feature documentaries where you can truly be with a character and allow to have that, uh, to, to take that moment and really enjoy uh, the silence with the character. In television, often it is more compressed and therefore you know, the thinking is different. It's much quicker. What brought okay. you to this project? Um, well, you know, I had been working with the uh, executive producer for a while. I know him for 20 years, and so um, uh, Craig Detron uh, asked me and said, "Like, this is uh, um, we're going to go and fly around the world, and we basically are going to be in every possible slum uh, that we can get our hands on because this show is about extreme poverty." And for me, when I do documentary work, what is most meaningful is uh, when I have something that you know, where my heart sings. And I think, for me, documentaries are all about giving voice to those who are in need, who won't have the possibility to be heard, and what better way to uh, make a show about extreme poverty, where uh, we are constantly uh, trying to help, but not really truly understanding what feeds into it. So there. I, I, that's wonderful. Um, Thank you, Tom. <laughs> no, it, it's I, I mean to me that's kind of cuts to the core of what I believe we do as documentarians, which is to to stand up for the grandeur of um, people, no matter where they are and what they what they do, um, and uh, that ne necessarily means taking a social stand in one way or another. So that's uh, that's yeah, you said it beautifully. I wanted to ask you about the editing piece. Um, Jim and I were talking about it before in the green room. Um, do you, you mentioned all of the elements of the scene for the picture, but are you, are you thinking about what's going to cut at the same time? So it's really interesting that you're asking that question because of course in my head I have a uh, perpetual list of shots of how they could potentially work together and uh, what am I missing to uh, create intimacy or what am I missing if it is a scene that's really uh, let through body language and uh, so all of these elements play a big role. Um, and so, you know, I think I take uh, the lead through what's happening in the moment and instinctively go to, oh, this is a very sensitive moment and I need to particularly capture that in a more intimate shot. I really need the audience to have the, the sense of being there, which is uh, very different from when you are uh, placing your camera more in an observational way. I mean, of course, we are observing what is going on, but I think with uh, especially highly active scene, um, my tendency is to place the viewer, which ultimately I am their eyes, mm -hmm. uh, into the scene so it becomes very visceral. Whereas when I am uh, observing, I would be further away and giving a, a scene more uh, privacy. Um, and in this particular show, that was not my intent. It was from the get-go, I want people to really be part of it because the whole aim will be to create activism along the lines of really seeing and experiencing it firsthand. And therefore, my edit list is highly motivated by that. But I want to tell you one other thing, which is uh, um, when I work, uh, when I do my cinema verite, um, 
I actually move very much like uh, a dancer. And the reason being is that uh, I actually studied modern dance with Martha Graham and Eric Hawkins and Mary Anthony. And so... Who my mother danced with. <laughs> yeah. So it is quite funny to me that, you know, I see myself uh, in a way moving about as if I am dancing a pas de deux. Oh, right? That's wonderful. Uh, it's wonderful. I, I mean, I do the same. So it's... It, it, and I need to tell you that Claudia and I and four other wonderful camera people, uh, uh, one of whom I named today, are part of a group called the Camera Collective. And, uh, and we all look, our, our footage looks a lot alike. That's all I gotta say. It's, it, it, we all have our differences, and sometimes we argue about them. But, uh, but more than not, we, we, we have this uniformity of style which we're all very proud of. Yes, and because we are very passionate about what we're doing, I think that the key part of making, you know, impactful films or um, you know, uh, doing great cinematography is that uh, you're looking for a way to, uh, you know, tell the story visually uh, without too much explanations, and that passion really feeds me, and that's also what inspires me. The Zeiss Bodice, exclusive to Sony's full-frame mirrorless camera system. It captures sharp images in corner-to-corner -corner clarity, giving depth of field and focus distance via an OLED display. That's inspiration made by Zeiss. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next time for another edition of Full Exposure. To listen to an extended version of this interview, go to ZeissFullExposure.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more about the latest equipment from Zeiss, head over to Zeiss.com. This has been a production of Sugared Studios.